Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm actually really honoured that you're all here. Thank you so much for coming. I know you could be listening to Randall doing some excellent comedy downstairs. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Jo Franchetti. I am a developer advocate at Spotify, and that is my kitten, Puff. And I am here to talk about stuff that might be going on in your heads right now. The last few years, we've had a pretty tough time. We've had the pandemic, we've had recession, we're going through a massive amount of redundancies in the tech industry at the moment. We've got an energy crisis going on. We have climate change happening. We've got potential third world war on our doorstep. Like, there's a lot going on at the moment. So let's talk about feelings and mental health and the difficult things that we might prefer not to think about most of the time. And who am I to tell you this stuff? I'm not a medical professional, but I am someone who has gone through depression, anxiety, CPTSD, and I've had almost a decade of working with a therapist. And I'm also a nerd, so I've done a lot of personal research on this because that's what we do when we get interested in something. And I've spoken to a lot of folks who work in the tech industry, my job is deaf advocacy, and I've seen that a lot of people are suffering from the same things that I did. A lot of people are feeling the same, they're feeling similar issues. And I know things like stress and mental illness and mental health can be difficult to talk about and difficult to face. So I'm here to give you some nuggets of thoughts that you can take away and ponder on yourselves and start your own mental health journeys. And not everything in this talk is going to resonate with you. I kind of hope that everything in this talk doesn't resonate with you, because that's a lot. Um, but what I do want to do is talk about the hard things, talk about the things that are sometimes considered taboo to talk about, and give us easy language to talk with our friends and our colleagues. You know, if this stuff doesn't affect you, it might well affect somebody that you work with or your friends, and it'll give you some advice to give to, to pass on to them. We only have an hour, so I don't have, I'm not able to go into a huge amount of depth on many of these topics, but like I say, I want to give you enough information to start your own journey, because we all need to get better at talking about mental health with each other openly and frankly. Before we get started, just a content warning, this talk does go over some quite heavy topics. We will be talking, as I mentioned, about mental health, about politics, about disordered thinking, about self-harm, and if any of these topics are things that you just don't want to hear about right now, I absolutely will not be offended if you need to leave, or if at any point during the talk you need to leave. The most important thing is that you take care of yourselves, so please, if you need to, don't worry about it. Um, I shall also point out that the content covered in this talk is my own opinions and does not necessarily reflect those of my employer. So, let's start with a story. It's a weekday. You wake up, you're feeling tired, and the dread sets in. It's another day of work. Getting up, oh god, it's a struggle. Your head feels heavy, your brain is sluggish. You drag yourself out of bed and see the time and you have to dash straight to your desk because you've got a meeting in two minutes and you woke up late. And you have a long to-do list of things that you need to get done today. But after your meeting, you decide you're going to check your email. So you read your email and then you mark all the ones that are important as unread because you're going to get to them later. And you maybe scroll some social media, and you read some articles, you maybe watch some YouTube videos, check on your Slack, and before you know it, it's lunchtime, and you've not actually got anything done yet. So now you're stressed, so you decide, I'm going to take lunch at my desk, and you eat a crappy packet sandwich at your desk, and you start to feel the panic set in. And your afternoon is clobbered with meetings, so you don't actually get to start on your own work until about 5 p.m. when everybody finally leaves you alone. And then you try and cram an entire day's work into a few hours of your evening. And by this point, you are so exhausted. And you'd hoped that morning that maybe you'd be able to do something fun in the evening, like a hobby or go and see friends. 
but you end up not having quite enough energy to pick anything up. So you order some comfort food, you watch TV, and you decide to get an early night so that you won't feel tired tomorrow. And as you climb into bed, you realize that you didn't actually leave the house today. And your head hits the pillow, and suddenly all of those things that you didn't manage to do today start circling through your head. You didn't reply to that email that you were supposed to. You didn't get any housework done. You had a meeting with your boss and they made a weird comment. Do they think that you're slacking? Maybe they're thinking of firing you. Oh, I bet all your teammates don't have these problems. I bet they had a really productive day. I bet they had a really nice sociable evening. And all these horrible thoughts are going through your head. So to quieten the onslaught of these thoughts, you pick up your phone and you scroll through social media. Or you play a mindless game, anything to make your brain shut up. And eventually, at the small hours of the morning, you eventually fall asleep from actual exhaustion, realizing that you're going to be so tired when your alarm goes off in the morning. And come the weekend, you are so tired that you sleep half of the day on Saturday and you wake up at midday with this guilt that you've wasted half of your day that you could have been productive in. But instead, you've wasted all of those hours. Why are you so lazy? Why don't you have any energy? You can think about things that you'd like to do, but your brain is kind of fuzzy and uncooperative, and even starting them feels like it's going to take a lot of energy. And there are things that you wanted to do, but you cancel them because you think you've got to preserve your energy for the week. And yes, you have rested, but every second that you were resting, you have guilted yourself over it. You feel lazy, unproductive, and like you're falling behind everyone else. You're stressed, you're tired, your body aches, and you feel nauseous, and you just wonder, when is this going to get better? And if any of that was relatable to you, I'm going to talk through some of the factors that are maybe causing these feelings and these actions in us. But first, I would like to introduce you to this thing here. This is your autonomic nervous system. And this is a system in your body that you don't consciously control, but it regulates a lot of involuntary uh, physiological processes. So it regulates your heart rate, your respiration, your blood pressure, digestion, hormone release, all kinds of things. And this is the system that reacts when you are under threat. So it produces your fight or flight response, which is designed to help you defend yourself or to get away from a dangerous situation. And when you're under stress, the autonomic nervous system kicks into action and it sends messages around your body, getting adrenaline and cortisol and oxygen to the places where they need to be. But when it does this, we get a whole load of physical symptoms. So your heart rate will increase, you, uh, you will uh, start breathing quicker, your blood pressure will rise, and you will get a bunch of physical symptoms. And then overabundance of stress hormones can cause things like headaches, nausea, shortness of breath, shakiness, stomach aches. And you can imagine if you're feeling stress or anxiety over a prolonged period of time, your nervous system is constantly active. It's constantly sending these stress hormones into your body. And it becomes easier to trigger with smaller things. Kind of like if you imagine a cart going along a track and there's a nice well-worn groove and that car can just easily bump back into that track and start sending those stress hormones out for smaller and smaller things. It floods your body with warnings even when the situation isn't necessarily life or death, frequently calling the, causing those physical symptoms like headaches and nausea and stomach aches. And that can take a toll on your overall physical health. And in today's world, with all of the things that I mentioned earlier going on, lots of people are noticing these physical symptoms without realizing the root cause of them. It's an incredibly stressful time to be alive at the moment. And especially working in the tech industry, a lot of us are stressed all the time. And many of us in our, are in a constant state of heightened anxiety and a constant state of uh, active uh, autonomic nervous system. So let's start talking about anxiety. A is for anxiety. And anxiety is a normal part of life. 
it's normal to feel anxious when you're in a situation that you've not encountered before or something stressful is about to happen to you, like, for example, a job interview or doing public speaking. It's a normal reaction to a tough situation and the physical symptoms for anxiety to look out for are rapid breathing, sped up heart rate, lightheadedness, dizziness, stomach aches, indigestion, chest pain, oh god it's so much fun, fatigue, insomnia, headaches and in the short term anxiety will increase your breathing rate and your heart rate which gets oxygen to your brain which helps you think about how you're gonna get yourself out of a situation. Great, we like that. But an excessive or persistent state of anxiety can have an absolutely devastating effect on your physical and mental health. Your poor nervous system is constantly active, is constantly giving your body messages that you're in danger. And long-term anxiety and panic attacks can cause your brain to release stress hormones on a regular basis, which increases the frequency of symptoms like headaches, dizziness, and can even lead to depression. And constantly increased levels of the stress hormone in your body, cortisol, can lead to immune system issues, so that you get ill more often. I don't know if you notice when you have a, when you feel stressed, you get colds more frequently because your body is just working less well. Uh, it can lead to IBS, which means that you have stomach aches regularly. It can cause weight gain. It can cause fatigue. It can really screw over your physical health. And anxiety can stop you from doing the very things that might help you to get over the anxiety, like trying new things or doing something social or even just getting outside into sunlight and nature. The good news is there are plenty of ways that we can help ourselves calm our anxiety, but they will all be very different depending on the individual. So if you feel yourself in a state of anxiety, these are some of the things that you can do. And the first thing is to remember to breathe. So when you're in that anxious spiral and your brain is starting to whirlwind and you find yourself breathing rapidly, your heart rate is increased, try and get back to a normal state. Try and get your heart rate back down. Try and get your breathing back to normal. I have an app on my watch which buzzes on my wrist to give me a breathing timing. So breathe in for this long, hold for this long, breathe out for this long. If you don't have that, you can just count it. Count to seven for a slow breathe in, hold, and then count to seven for a slow breathe out. And then the other things that you can do are called grounding techniques. And these are based around your senses. And these, again, will be very diff different for different people. But what they will do is they will help your brain to remember we're actually safe, we're okay, this situation is just something that I need to spend a little bit more time thinking about. So you can look at nature. Looking at nature often helps looking into the distance, uh, listening to something that you find calming, be it music or nature sounds can help smelling something nice, so like a scented candle or a soap or some perfume, something that you enjoy the smell of, touching something soft, so a nice scarf or, or a pet, if you can pet a pet that really helps. Um, also playing with fidget toys or stress balls can really help your brain just ground itself again. And then finally tasting something, so a nice cup of caffeine-free tea or a glass of cool water or some fruit or some slow-release carbohydrates. All of these can be nice grounding techniques just to take yourself out of the panic state and back into a sensible thinking state. And learning your own self-soothing is absolutely vital because, as I said, extended periods of anxiety can really leave you feeling incredibly tired and burnt out. And that takes us on to our next letter. B is for burnout. And burnout is a state of physical and emotional exhaustion. And it can occur when you experience long-term stress and long-term anxiety. Or if you've been physically or emotionally drained for a long time. And the common signs of burnout are feeling tired or drained a lot of the time, feeling helpless or trapped in your current situation, feeling detached from your situation, like you just don't care anymore. Having a cynical or negative outlook in general, feeling a lot of self-doubt, 
procrastinating frequently and feeling overwhelmed frequently are all signs of burnout. A burnout can cause your brain to feel foggy and uncooperative, and it's what happens when you push and push yourself through stress and don't give yourself that time to rest and recover. And since lockdown and increased remote working, the lines between work and home life have really blurred. And many of us are working longer hours, and some of us have been looking after children while also working, or working late into the night, and our means of social interaction have also changed, especially for those of us who aren't lucky enough to have a separate home and office space. Which means it's more difficult for us to switch off in the evening, and it's easier for us to just occasionally pick up stuff that might be stressful in the evening. We want to be that model employee, we want to try and be on 24-7, and it's just not good for you. And along with the brain fog, the overwhelm, the exhaustion, burnout can lead to depression and to suicidal thoughts. And many of the people that I've spoken to who have suffered burnout talk about just wishing that things would stop. And unfortunately for a lot of people, the decision is that the way to make things stop is the ultimate stop. And burnout isn't something that will go away on its own. It will actually worsen if you don't address it. If you ignore the signs of burnout, it can cause actual further harm to your physical and mental health. Burnout can lead to chronic fatigue, and you will find yourself needing to sleep more and more to get through normal everyday tasks. It can lead to immune system issues, actually damage your immune system. It can lead to memory loss, both short and long term. And if you push past your limits, this isn't something that you can just take a holiday from. Burnout is no joke. But it can be avoided if you take time to put self-care into your daily routine. Even if you're working long hours or studying or taking care of children, you have to sprinkle just a tiny bit of joy into your day. <laughs> it's really essential to replenish your energy, to replenish your emotional and physical energy. And it'll help your capability to focus as well. So if you're having trouble squeezing these kind of activities into your schedule, and this is something that I am terrible at, I'm like, oh, I don't have time to rest, I've got to do all of these things. Like, no, you have to give yourself this time. So something that I've done which has been helpful for me is journaling how I'm spending my time throughout the day. So you can do this on paper, in a spreadsheet, in an app, uh, but what you should do is cut your day into blocks of time, maybe two hour blocks. Record what you're doing in each block, how you felt about it on a scale of one to ten, where one equals angry, drained, uh, disengaged, and one is joyful, energized, really enjoying this, and how valuable the activity is, and who you spent that time with. And this will help you find opportunities to limit activities that you find draining, limit exposure to tasks or to people, or any situations that aren't essential that can put you in a negative mood. And you can also see ways to increase the experiences that boost your energy so that you can make space for restful and positive time away from work. Stress is kind of unavoidable in our jobs. Like, there's going to be stress, but burnout is presentable. And as much as it pains me to have to say this, and you know, I know this is stuff that we all know already, but <laughs> these five things are really gonna help. Uh, so get some exercise. It doesn't have to be, you know, an hour long workout at the gym. It can be just going for a brief stroll outside or even doing 15 minutes of stretching in your own home. Getting in touch with your body physically and how you're feeling can really just help your mental state. Uh, eat well, I know we all know this one as well. Get your vitamins, your good fats, your slow release carbohydrates. It's actually a natural antidepressant eating well. <laughs> I know. Uh, try and practice good sleep habits, so get into a relaxing bedtime ritual, and I will talk about this a little bit later on. And also ask for help. 
during stressful times, we do have a tendency to kind of fold in on ourselves and just try and keep ourselves safe. But we have friends and family who really want to help us. So if you find it difficult to ask for help and say, like, I just, you know, I need help with this extra bit of energy, or could you go to the shops for me, or could you remind me that I should go outside today? If you find that difficult, then just do try and organize a check-in with a friend or family, just so they can text you and be like, how's it going today? Did you manage to get outside at a certain time every day? It can really help. And the tech industry has so many cases of burnout. I bet every single one of you in this room knows somebody who is burnt out or has experienced it yourselves. And we have a tendency to sort of blur the lines between our jobs and our lives and our, our sense of self. And we continuously strive to be the smartest in the room and we compare ourselves to all the experts that we see all the time. So it's no surprise that when we're burning the candle at both ends, suddenly there's nothing left in the middle and we're like shocked by that. But there is another reason why we're all burning out and that is this one right here. Let's talk about capitalism. So if we look it up, Wikipedia tells us that capitalism is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. And the essential feature of capitalism is to make profit. So, in capitalism, we have a bunch of capital assets such as materials, factories, mines, privately owned land, that kind of thing, most of which are inherited, not earned, let's just admit it. And these people who own these things purchase labor in order to add value to their capital assets. And those laborers will build products which can be sold, getting more capital out at the end. And of course, those doing the labor are rewarded now. Some time in the past they weren't, and that was slavery, which is what capitalism was built upon. However, in order for profit to come out of the end, the labor has to be undervalued. It has to be less than it is worth, or we don't get profit at the end. That's, this is the whole basis of capitalism. And the majority of us are those laborers in the middle. We are working to create profit for a business owner somewhere. And I realize we all work in tech. We're all relatively well paid. We're all well off. <laughs> and we're using our skills and our creativity and our drive and our energy because we want to make the world a better place. The majority of us aren't thinking about making millions, we're just thinking about making nice things, making good things for the world. But the people at the top, the investors, the business owners, especially when we look at those of us who work for very large corporations, those folk at the top are mostly interested in making profit. And this is where one of the major factors in burnout comes in. You are working hard and want to do good things for the world, is at odds with the business owners who want to make profit at the end. And we work, we work in a world where working hard no longer gains us the capital required to live what might have been decades ago considered a comfortable life. Most of us will never be able to afford to buy a house. Some people can't even afford to buy heating and food. And we're taught to keep chasing that dollar to that switching off is unforgivable and we feel compelled to justify ourselves when we take a break. Hustle culture has absolutely lied to us that if we work hard and produce enough and if we go above and beyond that we can eventually reach that point of comfort but the truth is it just isn't possible for the majority of people. It can't be or the one percent wouldn't exist. There has to be people who are taken advantage of in order for others to rise. And not only that, capitalism becomes even more insidious when you consider our own internalized capitalism. So every time you think, oh, I'm going to take a rest day today, and then you think, oh, no, but I'm not being productive enough. Why do you need to be productive? Why isn't having a rest enough? We feel like we need to be productive because of this strange internalized little capitalistic voice in our head who says 
you've got to you've got to be better than everyone else you've got to be earning more than everybody else you've got to be doing more than everybody else and it's a it's a story that is told to us when we're very small it starts off when you're in school and you get good grades and your teacher praises you for getting good grades or you perform well on a project and your parents are like well done when you're consistently praised for being good at something, for being hardworking and dedicated, you learn that you have to excel to be worthy and that you have to be constantly working harder. And I hate to generalize, but I'm assuming a lot of the people in this room were that little nerdy kid in school who wanted to be the top of their class. You're striving to get the teacher's praise and we learn to base our self-worth on what we can produce not who we are, which means that we feel like we have to be constantly productive. We live with this internalized capitalism. We don't even need a boss to tell us anymore that we need to be working harder. We do it to ourselves. And capitalism smiles and lets us get on with it because that's where profit is made. Capitalism will let you work yourself into an early grave and it'll shrug and turn away as you are easily replaced. And I'm afraid I don't have much advice for how to avoid capitalism. Uh, help your fellow folks. Listen when people say they are struggling. Give to charities. Volunteer your time. Make sure you allow yourself to do things that are enjoyable. Employ folks from minority backgrounds. Pay people a fair wage. Vote next time there's an election. All of this is quite depressing, which leads me on to my next letter, D is for depression. Anxiety and burn, burnout and overwork, amongst other things, can really impact your mental well-being. And record numbers of people at the moment are experiencing poor mental health. Globally, it's estimated that 5% of adults will get depression at some time in their lives. And depression is characterized by persistent sadness, loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities, lack of feelings of any kind of pleasure or pride or lack of any feelings of achievement. Depression can disturb your sleep, it can disturb your appetite, your concentration, it can affect how you interact with those around you. It drains your cognitive functions completely and it can sometimes feel like a downward spiral of hopelessness. And a good prediction of depression is self-criticism. You ever have that little nasty voice in your head that tells you that you're not good enough or that you're gonna fail or that you shouldn't even try? Self-criticism and low self-esteem can be caused by burnout, by perfectionism and by imposter syndrome, which I will talk about later. And they are very prevalent amongst people who work in the tech industry. Worsening matters, being self-critical, not only leads to depressive symptoms, but then those depressive symptoms can make your self-criticism even worse, and it's a fun wheel of awfulness. Depression is a real illness and should be treated as such. You should treat it with as much serious as you treat, for example, a broken leg. And the good news is that there is help available for depression. And I know it's easy to say, again, but there are things that can help you out depressive episodes. Things like getting exercise, eating well, getting outdoors, getting enough sleep. Like the things that we all already know. Similarly to helping with anxiety, uh, writing a mood diary can really help you understand what's put you in a depressive episode and maybe what you should avoid to get you out of it again in the future. Understanding the things that you can do to lift yourself out of a depressive episode is really important. It might mean making changes to your habits or trying new things. It's all very individual. And one of the best ways to understand those individual needs that you have and what's going on in your head is to do talking therapy. Getting a therapist can feel like a big step. I know it took me two years before I admitted to myself that I needed to speak to a therapist. But it's the best thing that I've ever done, and I will talk a little bit more deeply about therapy later. Um, and once you've spoken to a therapist, you might decide together that medication is a good route for you. Uh, much like finding a therapist, finding the correct medication is a very individual uh, and personal thing and you might find that you need to try a few different medications before you find the one that is right for you 
But the important thing is that you keep talking to your therapist and you keep talking to your doctor about how you feel and you make decisions and make changes as you need to. I would like to reiterate that there is no shame in seeking any of these options and there should be no shame in talking about them with your friends, with your colleagues, uh, with your bosses. <sighs> okay, that was all quite heavy going. So um, I wonder if the sound is going to work on this. I didn't think about this in, in advance. Um, we're going to have a little break and we're going to watch those are Rias, and those are actually more similar to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel, do not do it. Emmanuel? Emmanuel Todd Lopez. Emmanuel? That brings me great joy in my soul that you listened. I love you. You are a good boy. Come on. Come show them how big you are. Everybody thinks you and Humpty are the same type of cow. This is a... Emmanuel, do not do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel! Don't do it. I'm trying to educate people right now, okay? Can you just stop? You're just tall. Emmanuel, every time, Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. Emmanuel, don't choose violence today. Please, every day we go through this. Gosh, it's never ending. So Emmanuel is an emu. This is the best segue I have ever written. Emmanuel is an emu. Emu are flightless birds. Emmanuel loves a fight. F is for fight or flight response. <laughs> your fight or flight response is your body's natural psychological reaction to a stressful, a frightening, a dangerous event. And it's activated by a perception of threat. It activates the nervous system that we spoke about earlier, releasing hormones and preparing your body to either fight or run away from danger. And it's an, it's an ingrained survival instinct from, you know, back when our millions of years ago ancient ancestors were facing hungry saber-toothed tigers, the nervous system would flood with energy, they'd be able to bop it on the nose or run. And we call these states of high arousal or high activation. And many of the high arousal situations that we face in the modern world are a lot more psychological than facing a saber-toothed tiger. So, like I mentioned, job interviews, speaking in public, difficult meetings, salary discussions, that kind of thing. The problem comes when you're in that long-term state of activation. So long-term and repeated stress causes your nervous system to be in constant fight or flight mode, and it's exhausting. It means that, as I mentioned, even smaller stressors can cause you to sort of fly into that anxious mode, and it can become physically overwhelming to make even small stressors, like making a decision or trying something new. And psychologists... <clears throat> I'm going to have a drink, sorry, everybody. Psychologists have come to realize that our bodies actually have two other options as well as fight or flight. There's also freeze and fawn. So not only can stress give you the energy to fight and run away, it can also cause you to freeze, to make your body just shut down completely. If you've ever come out of a interview or a stressful situation and you're like, God, I can't remember a word I said in there. That's actually a freeze response. That's your body taking you out of what it thinks is a stressful situation and going into kind of autopilot. If you ever find yourself procrastinating over a long period of time, that again is a freeze response. It's your body saying, I know we're gonna, we need to do, we need to face this stressful thing, but let's not do it now. Uh, it's your body shutting down rather than doing something that it thinks might cause you physical damage. Super, super helpful, like, thanks body, that's great, just what I wanted. And getting out of a free state can be really tough. It requires a lot of self-kindness. So I spoke about that mean voice. Learning to get out of a freeze response, you really have to start listening to your kind voice who says, okay, we've decided to procrastinate. We're gonna allow ourselves this time to procrastinate. We want maybe like half an hour. 
we'll go read a book or tidy the house a bit or whatever. But after half an hour, we're going to come back and we're going to do the thing. But listening to that kind voice is really difficult and takes a lot of practice. Breaking tasks that make you want to procrastinate up into small steps is another way of trying to get past that freeze response. So for me, going to the gym, I find really difficult. If I don't say we're going to go to the gym, instead I just say, we're going to put on our sweatpants. That's all we're going to do. Okay, now we've got the sweatpants on. Why don't we try putting on the trainers? That's an all right task. Okay, well now you've got the trainers and the sweatpants on. Let's just step outside the front door. Well, you may as well go to the gym now. <laughs> it works. So that's freeze. Fawning is a strategy that you learn to get yourselves out of trouble. It's a result of interacting with a difficult person. Uh, it's bending over backwards to please somebody. It's not just being nice and considerate. It's a response that's actually rooted in trauma. It's an over-niceness that stems from being somebody liking you being the only way to get out of a situation safely. So if you often find yourself apologizing for everything, or you find it difficult to say how you really feel in meetings, those are fawn responses. You're trying to consider the feelings of the other people before your own feelings. One I do is um, I end video calls like, thanks, that was awesome, thanks everybody, cool, yeah, brilliant, thanks, okay, bye! <laughs> like, everybody's got to love me so that they do the thing that I've asked them. And the problem with fawning is that you rarely put yourself first in situations. You think of the needs of everybody else in the room before you think of your own needs. And not only is this a problem because you're not thinking of your own needs, that you, when you act like this, you have a tendency to attract people who will take advantage of you because they will see what you are doing and they will go, ooh, I'll keep this person near me. They're going to do everything that I need them to. If you find yourself regularly giving a fawn response in difficult work situations, this is when you have to really start remembering boundaries and setting correct boundaries. You're allowed to say no to things. You also need to consider um, that conflict is sometimes necessary to get past a difficult place. It's also worth um, re-evaluating what you think of as conflict. Is it actually conflict or is it just a difficult conversation that you have to have with somebody? Something that I've heard a lot of my friends do who say sorry all the time is swap sorry for thank you. So instead of saying, sorry, I had to call this meeting, say thank you everybody for attending this meeting. Try and get yourself out of that sort of everybody has to love me. It's okay if some people don't love you. I'm still working through this one on my own. I want you all to love me. This one, I know, uh, I don't want to have to tell you to touch grass, but please touch some bloody grass. <laughs> Spending time in nature has been found to help with both anxiety and depression. Being in nature or even looking at pictures of nature reduces fear, it reduces stress, it reduces anxiety, and it actually increases pleasant feelings. Exposure to nature can reduce your blood pressure, it can reduce your heart rate, it can relax muscle tension, it reduces the production of stress hormones, it does so many amazing things for your body. Not only that, but getting outside, you'll get your vitamin D, which helps reduce fatigue, helps uh, boost your immune system, it helps with a whole host of nasty physical symptoms. And research has been done in schools and offices and hospitals, and has been found that even just having one plant in your room can make a significant dis difference on your stress and anxiety levels. And this is my favorite one. Some researchers in Australia asked a bunch of students to engage in a really dull, repetitive task where they had to press a key when a certain number flashed on a screen. And they had half of the students sat next to a window where they had a sort of load of grass and flowers to look at for 40 seconds in the middle of the test. And the other half of the students were sat next to a window where they looked out at a concrete rooftop. And the students who looked out the flowering green area made significantly fewer mistakes than the students who were looking at the concrete. So if you can't touch grass, at least look at a leaf. 
And with a lot of us working from home, it's even more difficult to get that time outside because we're not commuting anymore. You need to schedule time outside into your working day. Let's talk about working from home. It's been a welcome change for a lot of us, but there are things that we should be cognizant of while we do so. So research shows that people who work from home put in longer hours than people who are working from an office. And these longer hours obviously are going to negatively impact your health. You're in a stressful environment for longer. Not only that, when working remotely, we miss out on social engagements like that we would see when working in an office. And this can lead to a feeling of loneliness and loneliness can, fe can lead to heightened stress, anxiety and depression. And isolation isn't the only problem with working from home. I don't know about you, but I find that dealing with a lot of video calls makes me really stressed because I'm seeing my own face constantly. And that just really stresses me out. <laughs> I just really sometimes wish I could go back to in-person meetings. There are, of course, things that we can do to make our mental health better while we're working from home. And I know, again, this is a very privileged thing, but if you can have a separate room where you're working from where you're sleeping, it's absolutely vital to allow yourself to switch off outside of work hours. Make sure you've got a comfortable chair, desk, footrest, mouse uh, situation. As tempting as it is to work from the sofa or work from bed, do not do it. RSI is no joke. I have RSI in my wrist and it is not fun. Your workplace should have information about how to set up a workstation correctly. Take regular breaks away from your screens and that means away from your phone. When you're eating lunch, don't eat it at your desk. Actually enjoy the process of making lunch or going out and buying lunch. Enjoy the process of eating the food. Be mindful about what you're doing. Don't just shove it in your face while you're looking at your phone. Take some actual time to relax, to think about your day. Uh, have a window nearby you while you're working so that you can look into the distance. This not only helps with looking at a leaf, but it also helps your eye muscles to relax. Um, and try and do some nice social things if you can with your team. So um, arrange digital like coffee rooms or water coolers, do fun social events. With my old job, we did uh, online life drawing classes and online pottery classes, and we did an online pasta making class with an old nonna in, in a castle in Italy. That was amazing. That social interaction is so important for your mental health. Remember to set boundaries for when you are at home and when you are at work, and actually switch off during the home times. It's so easy to go, oh, I'll just reply to that email that I forgot to, even though it's 11 o'clock at night, or I've been sat playing games and I've thought about a fix to that bug, I'll just go do it now, just before I go to bed. And then suddenly you're back in that activated state just before you're about to try and go to sleep. Remember that you not only deserve downtime, but that you require it, and that by trying to be a good employee, you're potentially impacting your long-term ability to continue to be that good employee. And secondly, capitalism loves it when you work extra hours for free, so none of that. And maybe the reason that you're working extra hours outside of your official work hours is because of this thing here, imposter syndrome. How many of you have ever felt like you're not good enough, that you haven't done enough, uh, that you aren't as good as your colleagues? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of hands. Imposter syndrome is the feeling that by fraud or dumb luck, you've ended up in the same place as other people that you deem worthy and you feel like you don't deserve to be there. It's an incredibly universal feeling. It's not a disease, it's not an abnormality. And it isn't necessarily tied to depression or anxiety, but it can be intertwined with them. And it's very prevalent in highly intelligent, highly skilled people, just like the people who like to work in the tech industry. So where do these feelings come from? People like yourselves, who are highly skilled, highly intelligent, tend to believe that your colleagues are also highly skilled and highly intelligent. And that can sometimes lead you to judge yourself 
against these colleagues and to do so unfairly and harshly. This judgment can cause you to believe that you don't deserve any of the qualifications or the accolades or the opportunities that you've earned, or that in some way the skills that you've gathered aren't worth as much as the skills that your colleagues and peers have. And this can be coupled by a belief that any qualifications or accolades that you have earned somehow aren't praiseworthy, or somebody gave them to you by mistake, or you got it through luck. Have you ever worked and worked to achieve something only when you got it to feel like it wasn't enough or that someone made a mistake giving it to you you feel like what you've done wasn't enough so you have to instantly start working for the next thing and then when you get that that's not enough so you work for the next thing imposter syndrome doesn't let you feel pride or joy in any of your achievements but if so many of us all feel the same way Something fishy is going on. That person next to you who you thought was amazing and brilliant and better than you is feeling the same way that you are. They're also feeling imposter syndrome. And talking with other people in the industry has been the best balm for me for understanding that imposter syndrome is normal, but it's not correct. It's not based on fact. Whenever I'm worrying that everyone else around me knows more than me or that I don't actually belong, I like to think of this thing that I call Schrodinger's imposter syndrome. So this is the cognitive dissonance that imposter syndrome allows us. Somehow, I've convinced myself that my peers are far more brilliant, far more accomplished, far more intelligent than I am, and I'm just this little idiot who doesn't deserve to be amongst them, but also my peers are so stupid, so foolish, so gullible, that clever me has tricked them into believing that I belong amongst them. Now, these two things cannot belong alongside each other and, and be true. My logic is fallible and therefore also likely, so is my disbelief in myself. Okay, we would be here all day if I do every single letter of the alphabet. <laughs> so we're going to have another little break instead. Here's a video of a happy goat jumping. jump to P. Why not? P is for perfectionism. And perfectionism is a personality trait characterized by a person striving for flawlessness, setting high performance standards accompanied by critical self-evaluation concerning others' evaluation. That's what Wikipedia says. Uh, which sounds great. If I was an employer, I'd want to hire somebody who strived for flawlessness, who sets high performance standards and is cares about other people's uh, evaluations, they sound like exactly the kind of person that I want to hire. But perfectionism can actually be a blocker to achievement. If you've ever been in an interview and they ask you like, oh, you know, tell us about your strengths and your weaknesses, and you're like, oh, my weaknesses, I'm a perfectionist. Like, it is genuinely a weakness. Imagine that you're constantly striving for not, not good enough, not excellence. You're striving for perfection. You can't help but set yourself up to fail. Achieving perfection is just not something that happens very often or perhaps doesn't ever happen at all. And the trouble is that for perfectionists, our performance is intertwined with our sense of self. And when we don't succeed, we don't just feel disappointment in how we did, we feel disappointment in who we are as a person. We measure our own self-worth by how able we are to achieve perfection. And we can be very harsh on ourselves when we don't. And perfectionists often engage in this thing called catastrophic thinking or black and white thinking, where we know there's a spectrum of you did terribly, you did poorly, you did okay, you did 
good, you did well, you did excellently, you did perfectly. But for perfectionists, that scale is fully black and white. You either did perfectly, everything else is unacceptable, everything else is terrible. Even work that most people would call good enough will fall into the terrible category. And the tech industry and capitalism love it when we strive for perfection. They want us to be constantly building faster and better things, being the most successful, earning the most money so then we can spend it becoming more successful. And tech employers will often encourage this unhealthy belief that we should be constantly striving to work harder, to create more, to learn everything, as if learning everything was even possible. And perfectionist employees will often pressure themselves into tiredness, depression, paralysis and burnout, all while continuing to hand in perfectly good work, never daring to ask for help because that would be admitting that they can't be perfect. And much like imposter syndrome, perfectionists often disregard their own accomplishments because they're not perfect. They're never good enough. As soon as something that they're working towards is achieved, they instantly disregard it because it didn't bring that feeling of perfect that they were hoping for. So they immediately start working for the next thing and the next thing. And it's a very unsustainable and unhappy way to be. And it can quickly lead to overwork and to burnout. And perfectionism and procrastination are two things that also go hand in hand. If you're a perfectionist and you never start on your project, it can't be imperfect because you never started on it. If you find yourself procrastinating, maybe check whether or not you're trying to work out the perfect way to start the project. Or if you're procrastinating on ending the project, is it because you can't work out the perfect way to finish it? Try and work out whether good enough is okay, because for most people, good enough is what it is. It's good enough. Let's talk about Q. Q is for quiet quitting. Now, the concept of quiet quitting started trending on TikTok a year or so ago, and it's sort of split into two halves. Half of the trend is employers believing that remote workers aren't putting in the hours, and half of it is tired folks on minimum wage trying to empower their followers to resist hustle culture. But if we boil it down, what quiet quitting is, is when an employee puts no more effort into their job than is absolutely necessary, or puts in as much effort as they are paid for. It's about resisting the go over and above mentality. Quiet quitting is not a thing, although the media would love us to think that it's a thing. They love claiming that nobody wants to work anymore. But what it does is it suggests a norm where people should perform extra work outside of their job description, and that refusing to do so is tantamount to quitting, rather than what it is, which is a healthy setting of boundaries and a healthy understanding of fair compensation and worth. With the economy in its current state, many people haven't seen a pay rise in over a year. Inflation and the cost of living continues to increase. It's understandable that employees might want, might start to resent those, uh, the Harvard Business School calls them citizenship behaviors. So things like being the person who always books the meetings in, or going to an out-of-hours social, or coming in early, or working late. The exact kind of behaviours, by the way, that help a company keep a competitive edge. Employees are increasingly feeling that there's an imbalance in the amount of effort that they're putting in versus the amount of reward that they are seeing. It's also worth mentioning here that for women, for people of colour, and for immigrants who are requiring, require a visa, it's often a luxury not to take on these citizenship behaviours, because these people are often expected to do this extra emotional and manual labour in order to be recognised in the same way that their peers are recognised. Leaving work on time, not reading emails outside of work hours, maintaining a healthy work-life balance, None of these things are quiet quitting, they are all just taking care of yourself. Going over and above should be exactly that. It's over and above. It literally cannot be the expected norm because then it would be the norm, it wouldn't be over and above. And yes, of course we are all ready to do these behaviours, we all 
come in early when we need to, we all work late when we need to, we will attend those out of hours socials, but it cannot be the norm. It has to be over and above. Otherwise it's just theft of labor. You're just doing more work than you're getting paid for. And yeah, doing more work than you're getting paid for, let's not do that. Instead, let's rest. You need to rest. Please everybody, have a rest. Rest reduces stress, it aids your concentration, it helps your body to recover physically. When you rest, your nervous system has time to get out of that heightened state and return to a normal balance. It allows your brain time to sort through problems. When you rest, you can actually more easily work through anxious thoughts. You can start to be mindful. You'll be more creative when you're rested. You'll be better able to handle stress, to handle making decisions. And getting rest can sometimes require planning and discipline. Sometimes you need to actually book in the rest time and stick to it. And you need to learn to say no to the people who are like, oh, I know you booked in that rest time, but can you just, like, no. Avoid filling the time with chores. Don't spend the entire time staring at a screen or a TV or a phone or a monitor. And you have to learn to take responsibility for your own time. You are not a victim of the demands on your time. You are the only one who is in control of the things that you do. Even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes, you need to book in the time to allow yourself to do the things that you want to do. You are the only person who can do that for yourself. So find things that make you happy and make time for them every day. And while we talk about rest, the other important thing is getting quality sleep. Sleep is essential for your mental functioning, for your immune system, your metabolism, your memory, your attention, and just your health generally. I'm sure you will notice that when you've had a bad night's sleep, your mood and your just general executive function suffers the next day. Imagine what frequent bad nights of sleep are doing for you. And adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep. There's some really interesting research done into the difference between men and women. Men generally need less sleep than women due to hormone differences. If you are struggling, to get a good night's sleep, there's a bunch of things that you can do. So firstly, establish a realistic bedtime and stick to it every night, even on the weekends if you can. This means thinking about when you need to wake up to allow for eight hours of sleep, but not only eight hours sleep, also time to allow your body to actually process in the morning. So we're not running straight to our desk after eight hours of sleep, we're mentally preparing for the day. Exercise during the day will help you sleep. I know, I hate it. Less caffeine, alcohol, large meals in the, in the hours before you're about to go to bed. Checking your actual sleep environment and making your bed somewhere that you want to be can make a huge difference. So like, when was the last time you turned your mattress? Maybe do that. Or maybe considering treating yourself to a new mattress or some high thread count sheets, something nice that's going to make you actually want to be there and make you feel good while you're there. Uh, consider trying a weighted blanket. Make sure you're maintaining a comfortable temperature throughout the night and a low level of light while you sleep and then allowing daylight into the room in the morning when you're trying to wake up or getting a daylight alarm can help. Implement a screen-free time before bed. Shining light into your eyes not only stops your brain from producing the hormones that allow you to get a good night's sleep, but they also increase the risk of you getting a notification from work and going, oh, just check that email. I had to implement a strict phone in bedside drawer by 11 p.m. because otherwise I just do the doom scroll until 1 a.m. Staring at a screen is not only tired tiring on your eyes, it keeps your brain focused away from processing the thoughts of the day. And if you have trouble getting to sleep at night, it might be because you're not doing enough reflecting on the day before you go to bed. You can avoid that by spending some downtime before bed, just reflecting on the day. I don't know if you ever do that thing where you like your head hits the pillow and then you're like, oh, remember that embarrassing thing I said today? 
If you spend some time thinking about that embarrassing thing that you said today before your head is on the pillow, you will have a much better night's sleep. So try and schedule in like 20 minutes thinking time before you even lie down in bed. No phones, no screens, just you and your thoughts for the day. Think about filing away memories of what you did today, uh, checking off to-do items, going through social interactions that you had. Think about the, the facts of the day. So like, I didn't get that bug done. I'm annoyed about that. My friend cancelled on me for lunch and I'm really pissed off about it. Uh, I had a really lovely meeting today. That was great. Don't go into assumptions, which is where I know many of our heads go, where we go, I didn't get that bug fix today. That means I'm an idiot. My friend cancelled me on lunch. That means she probably hates me. Those are assumptions and not facts. Consider only the facts of your day. Allow yourself to process these things before your head hits the pillow and you will get a much better night's sleep. And if you find yourself struggling with switching off or struggling with the thoughts of the day, then I cannot, as I mentioned earlier, recommend enough going for talking therapy. It is the best thing that you could possibly do for yourselves. If there's one thing that you take away from this talk, it's this message here, get therapy. It's like booking a nice massage for your brain. Um, thanks to our government, getting therapy on the NHS in the UK can take a long time, but there's also plenty of websites where you can search for private therapists who specialize in all kinds of areas. I will share out the slides of this talk after I have a bunch of links of uh, different uh, counselling, different therapists, different um, uh, help schemes to help you find a therapist in a bunch of different places and I will keep adding them as I find out about new ones. If you're in the UK, the BCAP is where I'd recommend you can search via location, by specialism, by price. Um, and if you're in the LGBTQ plus community, then pink therapy is really amazing. Finding a therapist is an incredibly personal matter, and it's likely that the first person that you talk to will not be the one that you want to work with long term. What I recommend is shortlisting at least three people to have an initial chat with, talk to them about how they like to work, what their specialism is, uh, how you want to work with them, how regularly you want to meet, all kinds of things and get a feel for, you know, how this is going to mesh between them before deciding to move on with them long term. And, you know, even if you have had a couple of meetings and you decide this isn't the one, that's also okay. You may also find that your employer offers counselling or other mental wellness services, it's very worth asking your manager or your HR person to see if there are any free services that they offer. Whew. That was a lot. <laughs> I hope I've not overloaded all of you. I hope I have planted some seeds for all of you to think about over the next few days, weeks and months. I am always up for chatting. If you want to chat to me, you can get me at this is Joe Frank on Twitter. Please look after yourselves. We are in incredibly stressful times. There's some real shit going down in the tech industry at the moment and in the world in general. So look after yourselves, look after your friends, your colleagues in the tech industry. We're in interesting times and it's imperative that we remember to carve out those moments of joy for ourselves each day. Thank you so much for listening, everyone, and I hope you have a fantastic evening and weekend. Thank you.